So welcome. Thank you for joining us uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's James Crocker. I help run the model portfolio service at Albert T. Sharp. I'm a partner. I've been here for 10 years. And really, within the model portfolio service, we have a very clear philosophy that I think makes us distinct from a lot of our, our peer group. And that philosophy, essentially, the, at its core, is that the financial markets are inherently inefficient. Now, this being so, uh, effectively, we believe that that creates scope for individuals and funds to outperform over extended periods of time. Um, and because of that, we're very much benchmark agnostic. Uh, we don't, in fact, want to see people hugging the benchmark. Uh, we very much believe and we seek in active management. And really our job, I guess, at the end of the day, as a, as a DFM in model portfolio service world, really is to select the right manager at the right time in the right area. Now that's all very well and good. That's all very, that's all very fine, but you need order in order to do this in a, in a world of um, hugely huge competition. Uh, you really need a, a set of criteria. You need a framework. You need to know how to ask the right questions. And I think over the few, over the years I've been doing this, and here at Aberty Sharp in particular, we've developed what I think is a very clear framework for trying to understand and establish what it is that makes an outstanding manager. Um, by the same token, I think by, by establishing that, you can also identify maybe the weaker managers as well. But that's really uh, that rather negative aspect is not what we're going to talk about today. And I think in, in developing this framework, we, we think we know the right factors, the key factors in determining um, the right tem temperament um, and the, the right factors. And it's a very much a psychological and a, um, a question of trying to get into the head of the manager uh, that we try and do. There's only so much that numbers and statistics and cold, hard numbers can, can give you. So on that, um, I'm going to introduce you to Tim Crockford. And this is going to be a fairly informal uh, discussion. We're going to go through, and I hope that the object really of today is to, through Tim, you will get a, a clear picture as to how and why it is that we have arrived at, at the key fund that Tim manages, which is the Regnan Global Equity Impact Solutions Fund. But we've been following Tim for a number of years and very very nearly bought into one of his funds before he'd actually joined Regnan. Um, but the objective today is for a fairly informal chat to give you a bit of an insight into how we operate, uh, an insight into how Tim operates. And I, I hope the conclusion of this, that you will identify Tim as a, as a classic manager that fits beautifully into the, the Albert E. Sharp Model Portfolio Service approach. Now, I'm going to kind of, um, this is going to be a fairly chatty kind of, kind of, uh, um, conversation but certainly if anybody has any questions along the way by all means shout out and the Q&A button um, at the bottom of your screen uh, feel free to click on that uh, or raise your hand and I will try and pick up as much as I possibly can and, and put it on to Tim. So I guess the, the starting point let's, let's start at the beginning as good a place as any Tim do you want to give us a bit of your background, how you got into this game in the first place? Um, what uh, what opened your eyes to to the investment world? Sure. Um, and uh, apologies for the delay there, everyone. It's good to finally be on here. I um, I have to say, after the, the introduction, James, you've just given, I was uh, I was starting to wonder whether that was a tactic to get inside the head of the fund manager and uh, and psychologically test him. Um, so, uh, so I'm glad that things are all sorted out now. Um, so just in terms of where it began, um, so I'm not going to go all the way back because that will uh, take up the entire duration of the call. Um, but my, my career really started off first as a, um, as a, as a broker on the sell side. I, I, I joined a stockbroker, um, a UK based stockbroker, um, aptly named or interestingly named, uh, execution limited. Uh, that was uh, actually list, uh, actually based in uh, in Brick Lane, um, and the reason why I did that was because um, the person who influenced my or who piqued my interest in the industry uh, or in the financial services industry in the first place uh, worked as a, a as a sales trader. Um, so he worked as a stockbroker. 
Um, and so it, it seemed like a natural uh, place to start for me. Um, I managed to get a, uh, an internship before um, before I I, uh, I left university in in, in the summer months uh, at this broker, uh, which was handy because uh, uh, I I studied at a at University of Malta on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, which isn't uh, your typical I guess uh, Oxbridge um, sort of uh, establishment that fed the typical type of stockbroker and or investment bank. Um, and uh, having got a job at, uh, uh, at this broker, starting off uh, life in the financial services industry, um, I quickly realized that sales wasn't for me. Um, and that's no dis disrespect to my colleague who's also in the room in the, in the sales profession. Um, but personally, I thought that I wanted to get deeper in the weeds of the, the companies that we were looking at. Um, and I was lucky because there was an opportunity uh, that arose at a very tiny uh, European equity uh, investing boutique called Sourcecap, which was uh, which was actually seeded by this uh, broker that I was working at. Um, that, by the way, that was headed by a chap called Andrew Parry, who is now uh, the head of uh, investments here at uh, J. O. Hambro. Um, and yeah, and I joined that uh, that that uh, broker uh, that uh, investor as a uh, junior analyst, a very junior analyst, very very green, uh, and not necessarily in the environmental sense. And um, and that uh, that uh, business grew very rapidly, in fact. And um, despite it having been about five months before Lehman Brothers blowing up, um, and uh, and that business then got sold to uh, to Hermes, which is how I ended up uh, at Hermes prior to joining J. O. Hambro and Regnan. Okay, and that was that was when we first came into contact with you. Actually, was at, uh, when you ran. Um, one of the, the European funds, if I remember rightly, um, back back in the day. Um, but in terms of um, sort of heroes and, and you know people you've been close to, um, who outside of the industry, um, uh, you know, did you look to or have you looked to in the past? Interesting, any any sort of any books in particular, uh, or any films or anything like that that might have uh, piqued your interest in the early days. Uh, um... <laughs> <laughs> I suppose this is where you go down the, the greed is good route. Um, actually, I think in terms of in terms of um, in terms of people that 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 um, that that sort of influenced me, I don't really think I, I particularly from the industry point of view that you know I I sort of um, it wasn't until I got into the industry that I started getting interested in understanding the views and the ways of investing of, of certain of certain famous investors. Stan Druckermiller was one, one uh, global macro guy who I've always had a lot of respect for, not for just for the obvious reasons, but also given that uh, you know, stylistically, having heard him speak a few times, he was someone who always sort of uh, drew me in. Um, I think outside of the industry, you know, some of the... Uh, some of my interests are uh, probably not really related to, uh, to to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm a I'm a big uh, big Formula One fan. Uh, I'm a um, I'm, I'm dare I say it. I'm a I'm a Tottenham Hotspur fan as well, which uh, certainly doesn't uh, doesn't uh, give me the uh, the correct uh, winning mentality backing that you would like to see probably in a in a person in this industry. Um, but I think, um, but in terms of books, I think one of the first books I remember being given when I joined, um, certainly when I joined uh, 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 on the investment side of the industry was, uh, was the, uh, the, the old Michael Lewis uh, series of books, The Liars Pokers of the World. And, uh, and there was a whole um, sort of, uh, sort of um, a chain of books from that, which he then went on to author, uh, which I was always a big fan of. Uh, more recently, by the way, um, in, in terms of recent reads, uh, there's a book that I have to try and get everyone I can into, uh, a book which was recently published this year by a chap called, uh, written by a chap called Christopher Leonard, uh, called uh, Lords of uh, Easy Money, um, which, uh, which I would very much recommend to everyone because it's, it, it pretty much details a lot of what we've seen since the Lehman Brothers collapse and since the global financial period in 2008 and how that's affected the world that uh, James, you and I um, work in on a day-to-day -day basis. As a matter of interest, as I'm, I'm aware of the book, actually. By any chance, does that book end up in a sort of a slightly um, cataclysmic ending with a horrible warning about the end of the world type thing? <laughs> is it? 
I, I, I'm, I don't think it's that, um, that oblivious, uh, that, that, uh, that um, yeah, that extreme. I think, I think that the gist of it, though, is, is very relevant to where we are in the cycle today. Um, you know, that ultimately we've, um, we've replaced one problem with a, with a similar challenge, perhaps in, in markets. And, and uh, this addiction that we've had to, uh, to low rates has, has, um, you know, has caused dislocations in, in, uh, in, in the market, which are, would have otherwise naturally even themselves out over the years uh so it's it's i guess the way it ends is uh without wanting to spoil it for everyone um because it's i really would recommend it uh it is very much of a, a sort of buyers beware um sort of tone without giving away yeah. what that is about yeah the, the reason i say that is that nearly every book i've read of late <laughs> uh, it feels to me ends up with some kind of an armageddon uh horrific scenario if it's not ray dalio and and i would say anybody um, he's not aware of Ray Dalio's recent uh, stuff that he's put out. Well, I, I, I saw it on YouTube about the changing of the world order, which is really worth, really interesting, worth looking at. But everything from uh, the Mandibles, uh, from Lion, Lionel Shriver, you know, it's a pretty uh, horrific outcome. And I just, I don't, I'm not reading anything that talks about a bullish outcome in which the markets start roaring back and. Uh, and America saves the day, and, uh, and everything is and everything is okay. It's, it's it, the absolute opposite to me right now. I think um, it's 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 interesting you say that, James, because I just think you know over the years, um, you know, certainly over over my career on the investment side, I think you, you, as you become more more senior in this space, I think you you, you gradually learn to 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 naturally sort of you know edge away from the more. Uh, emotional accounts um and i will still read people i do read uh, ray dalio stuff um i have to say he's he he tends to 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 talk more about himself at times than uh, than about what he's doing but uh um i guess fair enough in his case um but i but you know, ultimately i think what i you know i think i've i've um you know definitely over the years gravitated more towards looking at factual pragmatic research um, as opposed to dogmatic uh, ingrained views not, not to say i don't read them you know i think it's it's uh, you know i'm a big fan of albert edwards as well who's uh, who's one of the strategists that i've followed over the years uh, but ultimately i think with the sort of research that i find more useful on a day-to-day -day basis certainly in terms of how we balance the portfolio um, and uh, and the sort of day-to-day -day risk management that we do it it is much more rooted in a much more data-driven approach and understanding and looking at what is going on, um, as opposed to uh, to listening to to stories and 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 chasing narratives. Mm. I guess one of the questions, maybe at this point, is you know, do you regard yourself as an optimist, realist, pessimist, any of the above? I think the honest answer is my my natural inclination is is as an optimist, which is why I ended up doing <laughs> equities probably and and and. Uh, you know, and, and certainly uh, structural growth areas like the ones that we look at in the uh, in the fund that I'll uh, hopefully talk to you about at some point. Um, but I think you know, again, it is the the trick for me has really been uh, you know mastering the real or trying to master the reality in the spew of data, the spew of information that is that is uh, and different views that is uh, available at any one point in time over a particular subject, whether that's macroeconomics whether that's um strategy whether that's actual um you know single equities so i think uh, you know I, I think realism is a is is a big part of what we do um and, and i think i've built a team around me that that actually has a, a really nice balance we've we're sort of uh, i would i would describe us as uh, two optimists two pessimists that end up in a in a sort of realism balance <laughs> um so i think but i think ultimately that you know the 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 to some extent, you, to be an, a long-term equity investor, you do have to have some vision as towards what these, you know, exciting nascent areas that we're ultimately directing capital towards can turn into five, ten years down the line. We're not value investors. We're not, you know, sort of deep value type uh, uh, investors. Clearly, in terms of what we do, even though we will invest in value style equities. Um, so I think it's that that mindset of of understanding how structural change can ultimately transform the revenues and the cash flows of a business if you are patient, if you are willing to be invested for a long enough period of time for that success to compound. Yeah, we'll, we'll get on to some of the uh, some of the nitty gritty of the fund um, 
maybe in a minute um, and some maybe some of the, the holdings within there. I was just interested in terms of because you were given a fairly, uh, as far as I could see, a fairly uh, you know f- free run to build the team around you when you when you came and joined Regnan. Um, what was it you looked for in the analysts and the other individuals around you to uh, to get them to get to get what I would imagine would have been a job with a lot of applicants, a lot of people desperate to get the job. You must have had a pretty high, I'm guessing, a pretty high calibre of uh, applicant there. Um, uh, yes, we have. Well, we have. We certainly have a. a you know, the, the, the team around me is is arguably on paper ten times smarter than I am, uh, and will ever be. Certainly from an academic point of view. Um, you know, we've got a neuroscientist on the team. We've got a climate scientist, uh, and, and and a spew of, uh, of people who are who are who are, who are certainly very book smart. But that wasn't what I was looking for. What I was looking for beyond book smartness uh, was uh, was really an intellectual curiosity. Uh, I think that's possibly the single most important characteristic that I've ever looked for in people, not just people that, that I've, I've hired, people that I want to work with. Um, and that was, was a big driver in us wanting to join uh, the Joe Hambro family. Um, I think, you know, what is critical is the, the number one turnoff for me in terms of, you know, a, a potential applicant would be finding someone who takes, you know, what Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley say is as 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 you know Bible as as, as given. Um, I want people who understand that um, the world is an, an uncertain place. There are no givens, and as you alluded to, James, in the uh, in in the introduction, we are you know we are ultimately trying to benefit and profit from that uncertainty and that that uh, inefficiency. Um, you know, so what I really wanted was to build a bunch uh, a team of people around me who are who share that curiosity curiosity about what can potentially be in the future and why what is currently in the present is not discounting that effectively. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as a matter of interest, are you still growing the team? Have you, have you pretty much got everyone there now? Our how investment... Many, how many have you got around you right now? So the investment team is a four-person strong team and, and that's unlikely to change. Um, it, it's the same team that was in place uh, back in Hermes uh, or Federated Hermes uh, back in 2016, uh, when we started building the strategy uh, over there, um, the, the the team was was very much put together with a view as to you know why we needed each of those specific skill sets, uh, and we wanted to be fit for purpose and fit for the end point, if you like, uh, at the beginning. Uh, but what is changing, what is certainly growing around us is the broader Regnan research platform that we have access to uh, on a day to day basis. And that's, you know, the, the way to think of those that team, they're not stock pickers, they're a team of, uh, of you know, sustainability experts with a particular subject matter field uh, of expertise, whereby we can draw on that, that, that subject matter knowledge to be able to then you know, make better stock decisions uh, ultimately in, in terms of the long term investments that we're making on behalf of our clients. Um, but that is a critical part, nevertheless, of our process. And that's that's a resource which is fairly rich, but uh, very much with with heads uh, sitting in, in, in Australia uh, because it's an Australian business um, that, that the group acquired back in in, uh, in 2019. Um, the uh, the the more recent hires that we've made have been here in the London office, where we've now got three people, uh, and we're growing uh, that that central resource. So how's how's it how has it been going of late? Because I guess one of the questions uh, that although the, relatively the, the funds uh, done okay, I guess, but there have been moments where you've been caught in the downdraft. I just wondered how it affects you mentally, how it affects the team. How do you how do you deal with the, when things are not working for you in the shorter term? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, look, we're not we're not shooting for just okay anyway. So I mean, you know, we we're, we're always trying to shoot the lights out uh, you know, despite whether the environment is a conducive one or it's 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 not. Um, how do we deal with that? How does one deal with that? Again, I guess that comes with experience to a certain extent, but it, it doesn't mean it gets easier. Um, I think, you know, I think what I have learned to do over the years is is um, uh, is balance my, you know, get, again, going back to that intellectual curiosity, you, you need to be able to balance that need to suck in as much information as possible with uh, a, a conscious 
uh, recognition that you need to unwind, you need to turn off, you need to get away from that constant barrage of information. Um, so, so I think over the years, again, I've, I've, I've certainly become more conscious of a need to, to step away from the desk as it were. And so have you felt about valuations over the last, I'm going back, you know, over the last two years, and I'm not necessarily talking about the fund, although this will have, this will have been relevant for you guys, but how, how were you feeling when you were seeing the tech stocks? Um, and I don't necessarily mean the apples and the Amazons, but you know, there were plenty of the growthier uh, stocks, particularly in the U S yes. watching their valuations balloon, I guess, during the course of, 2021 maybe at, at any point did did it occur to you that things were getting out of control and a bubble was forming uh yeah i mean i can say absolutely and 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 you know sound very smart because everyone's very smart in hindsight but uh no clearly we you know we the, the frustration in 2021 was that we would that is not our style we don't chase those Again, those story stocks or those conceptual investments where there's you know zero cash flow and uh, and none expected in the, near, the the near future. So I guess the way we felt more than anything was frustrated because of course they there were you know other uh, strategies, other funds who were um, you know should we say dipping into those sort of investments to their short term benefit. Um, you know, but I think if I look at valuations uh, where they got to in, at the peak. In some areas of the market, um, clearly, I think now, certainly with the benefit of hindsight, there are areas and subsectors and, and particular industries where valuations reached a level in absolute terms that they're unlikely to see uh, again for at least another five years, if not more than that. So I think now the way we feel now is, uh, of course, somewhat happy that we avoided those uh, those highly speculative areas. Um, the, the the challenge this year has been that uh, while of course that that um, that part of the market has been brought back down to earth, um, it's you know given what's going on in 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 uh, in the bond markets, it's it's had the effect of bringing everything back down to earth. So I think the way we feel now, um, to quote another very famous investor, is is you know now's the time to be greedy, given that we have the benefit of of looking at investments on a five to 10 year horizon. Now is the time to plant our seeds, as it were, and to go out there and find some really exciting opportunities, not in those speculative spaces, but in some of the areas that have been dragged down very much outside of the US, by the way, um, you know, where where we're seeing, you know, huge pockets of attractiveness and value being created. Um, you know, we've just added a, a Canadian automation business, for example, that serves the, uh, the, the pharmaceutical and uh, the, um, uh, and the electric vehicle battery manufacturing um, uh, industries, which we've just added to the portfolio on a 13 times, one three times PE, one year forward PE multiple. Uh, and that's one year, consensus PE. So, it, it, you know, it's, it's telling you something about, uh, you know, to what extent that value is appearing. But I think you, you kind of alluded to it yourself, James, that there are some areas, probably a lot of which are in the US, which still need to see uh, a, a, a level of deflation happen before they come back down to, a, to earth and to a realistic level. Yeah. I mean, this is probably a relevant moment for me to mention that one of the aspects of the fund that attracted us really was the fact that we could see um you know th these were companies that were likely to well i think in your words in one of your slides in that that i might use in a minute min to tomorrow's leaders today not yep. a million miles away from what the bailey gifford guys are saying uh well that's but that's what we want uh that's what we want to see in the but we obviously don't want to overpay for it and i think that we felt uh, especially in retrospect, we might have been a bit slow, um, but a very crowded, cramped, potentially overcrowded trade in some of the, the even the larger tech names that we still like. Uh, the valuation now looks a lot more attractive, but it, it you know it was getting a bit stretched for us. And I think the one that, the one thing that we certainly like, it, as I said, is the fact that uh, some of the names in the portfolio uh, are, are quite new to me, and they they may well be to to other. Uh, people but we'll, we'll just get on to that in a step in a sec um 
I guess the really the the um, you know, the, the slightly more sort of personal question before we get on to the fund is is where you, or this is the most dreadful question of all time is where do you see where do you see yourself in five years time type of thing but I mean you know if you were to win the euro millions I've just noticed it's 150 million quid tonight uh, I might even <laughs> have a pop myself if you were to to win it are we going to see you at, on at your desk first thing tomorrow morning um, um sorry to, to to let to tell you that yes you will um you'll still see me uh in the same on the same desk uh uh my assets under management in the fund might have jumped a little bit uh by approximately 150 million um but uh yes uh, I, I, you know, ultimately you know this is this is something i do because i love it i think um if my, if my colleague will cover his ears here you know this is something i i do for for free because this is something i i, I love doing and, and it's something which is you know, it's always interested me, even before I knew exactly what uh what the difference was between a fund manager and a stockbroker. So, uh, um, you know, I, th I think what I find intriguing is is the fact that you can, you know, it, you're you're taking your view of the world and you're taking your view of these exciting up and coming industries and literally putting your clients' money as well as your own money uh, where your mouth is. So, if we did, uh, if I was fortunate enough to uh, win the uh, Euro Millions tomorrow. Um, you know, you'd see that most of that money, at least, uh, certainly an amount going to uh, to some philanthropic causes, but otherwise, uh, a lot of that would end up in the fund. Wow. Well, I tell you what, on, on that, well, why, tell us a bit more about the fund, then. Give us a give us a, a two or three minute pitch. I've got um, I've got slides here I can use at my end uh, to kind of illustrate some of the some of the names if you want. But uh, yeah, give give us a, an outline of the fund and, and what it's all about. Sure, and you know, I, I I don't really want to go into the into the weeds of uh, the process and all that because um, you know that would probably be less interesting. But uh, I've just come back from a from a marketing trip in the in the US, and the first question that I got asked by uh, everyone I saw was, "Give me your value prop, your give your value proposition," which is uh, which is normally um, put out there as value prop. Um, sorry for that accent. My wife's from the US, so I'm allowed to do that. Um, the the uh, so the value proposition is simple. You know, ultimately, what we are doing, you know, using the lens of impact investing, is looking for businesses, typically mid cap type businesses that can grow into large caps or even mega caps over the course of the holding period, because of well, really three things. First and foremost, it is a business that derives their revenues, derives their earnings from a particular product or service that can solve a particular environmental or social challenge. And as a result of a growing demand for a solution to that challenge, that is driving up the size of the market for that product or service and expanding, if you like, the, the, the potential revenue that could be generated by that business. The second thing we need to see is that that business, that company has a, in, an innovative proposition, an innovative solution that is such that as that market grows, as demand for this product or service grows, they can hang on to their market share, right? So it's not just about investing in commoditized areas. We're looking for innovation. We're looking for product differentiation and moats. And then finally, and most critically, and this kind of alludes or plays back into some of the questions that you've asked me earlier on, James, what we need to be able to comfortably determine is that that future potential as that market growth and that revenue growth and earnings growth is recognized is not discounted in the future cash flow expectations for that business prior to investing in it so it really is it simply you know it simply revolves on those sort of three legs as it were um you know and as, as you sort of use the line earlier on james what we're really looking for is to use this as a lens to find uh you know tomorrow's blue chip stocks before the market has found them um you know so you're not going to see uh, obviously, I couldn't possibly comment on, on other funds, but you mentioned another name earlier on. You know, we, we, we typically tend to have a different profile in terms of what ends up in the portfolio. And I believe you have a slide uh, um, which I sent to you earlier on, if you, if you did want to share that. You know, hopefully a lot of the names that you'll see both on this slide and, and more broadly across the, uh, the 31 holdings in the portfolio, 
they're not going to be your Microsofts, your Facebooks, your Apples, your, uh, you know, your Netflixes, your Teslas. They're going to be uh, names that are businesses which perhaps haven't yet materialized into much larger businesses, but we believe have the potential to do so. You just need to have that that vision in terms of the understanding the the growth drivers uh and of course you need to have there we go um it's now being shared on screen hopefully everyone can see that um yeah hopefully you know these are companies which uh which won't uh be in everyone's uh, uh typical global equity exposures and everyone's typical global equity portfolios um i won't i won't go into all of these businesses because of course we will be here for another hour or so um but you know just to give you one example the bottom left hand side ats is that company uh i was alluding to earlier on uh that that uh, it's a canadian automation business uh, listed on the toronto stock exchange um you know which is really really exciting company in the right area um with the with the right product uh they help their their customers in the health industry and in the the ev battery space uh automate their production lines and, and scale them up uh, and of course not only are those two areas whereby demand for the end products of those two different applications those two different industries is growing dramatically uh but of course in a world where everyone's hugely conscious about costs increasing about the inflationary pressures that we've uh, that we've faced over the last you know 12 months or so in that sort of a world, of course, one of the things that businesses that manufacture stuff are trying to do, that manufacture things are trying to do, is reduce their bill of materials. So all the more does it make these sort of automation propositions exciting, all the more does it make the value prop um, valuable, as it were, uh, for, for these sort of companies. In terms of a sort of a sector breakdown here, Am I right in saying, I'm just saying this without having this in, in front of me, how much of this falls into IT technology or I'm presuming that industrials must be a big chunk of this on a sector breakdown? Yes, so that's if you look at the, the the outputs, if you like, in terms of where the fund is positioned from a sectoral point of view, um, it is yeah, you're right. So industrials is one of the largest areas that that um, oh, the, the, one of the two big sectors which we have uh, overexposure to. We are overweight. Um, the the health sector is another one, in fact. So I think that the, the life sciences area in particular, um, as opposed to the big pharma companies, again, we, we're not after those sort of blue chip type stocks. Um, it's much more exposure to businesses that are, you know, powering one of, if I may say, one of the most exciting areas, um, you know, since perhaps the tech revolution in the early 1980s, uh, I think a very similar story is is, un, is is playing out in the in the in the healthcare space today. Um, you know, if you look at what we're seeing in the healthcare space, everyone knows, you know, the buzzwords like biotech. Uh, but in terms of what that really means, in terms of how it really applies to uh, uh, to healthcare on a day to day basis, um, what it's really manifesting in is it's changing. You know, we're changing the way we treat ailments, uh, not just like you know infectious disease, like obviously uh, COVID as such, um, uh, which we're all very aware of, sadly, um, but also non non infectious, non communicable diseases like like cancers and heart disease and um, and diabetes. And I think that's been a really exciting area whereby by investing in some of the businesses that are providing the, the platforms and the tools to discover these new therapies and to scale them up and to manufacture them on a large scale basis, you know, we're really at the very bottom of this hockey stick curve. You know, everyone's talked about biotech for a long time. But it's now that we're really seeing the exciting second generation and third bio, uh, generation biotech drugs start to hit the market. Um, things like cell therapies are, are, are now starting to proliferate. These are highly personalized medications that are made specifically for a cancer patient, for example, whereby they, the outcomes in which they generate are, you know, groundbreaking. Um, you know, and I think that has been, in terms of sectors, it has led us to having, you know, this, this, this largest exposure in the health area. Uh, but it's not, again, it's not through the sort of companies perhaps that you might expect. 
and and as you said, you asked about tech. Uh, that's probably uh, you know one of our largest relative underweights. It's an area where you know it's a sector which is of course dominated by the the big tech names, the, uh, the you know the Fang stocks of the world. Um, uh, you know, whereby typically those companies wouldn't qualify as an impact investment because why? Because those businesses don't derive their future value from solving an environmental or social challenge. And that's where the opportunity lies. That's where the demand growth lies. Um, you know, of course, companies like Microsoft or Google are doing good things on the, you know, on the periphery of their businesses. Yeah, but ultimately, Google is an advertising company, and and therefore its 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 you know its its business is very much dependent on the success or otherwise of their their um their advertising proposition for their clients. I mean, I have to say, one of the attractions to the fund was not necessarily that it was from some kind of an environmental desire on our behalf or the fact that we we want to expose our clients money to impact investing necessarily that wasn't the point the point of the selection of this fund was really more to the point that the total addressable market is effectively growing and growing under its own steam yeah you know the, the wider economic environment isn't irrelevant obviously some of these are probably going to work within cycles to, to to some degree um but these are i i regard i mean i try my hardest to not get bogged down into the growth versus value debate uh but nevertheless the one or two of these or quite a few of these are going to fall into the growth category if you want to pigeonhole them i guess uh, and i suppose based on future expected earnings if you want to if you want to put it define it that way Rightly or wrongly, but do you know what, roughly speaking, the, the PE of the um, of the of the fund is? You roughly at the moment, so what so, kind of yields we're looking at? So, well, I, I typically look at the PE because, um, well, certainly in terms of dividend yield, obviously this is not an income portfolio as as you would expect. Um, these are companies which will, uh, you know, build up uh, uh, their their earnings base and probably further down the line will have plenty of free cash flow to pay out to shareholders. Uh, but the, the the average holding in the fund is not at that stage yet. It's still scaling up. Um, so in, in PE terms, and 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 take this with a pinch of salt because in the markets we're in right now, the numbers changing every day. Uh, but I look at the median PE because um, um, because this is a, a very concentrated thirty one stock portfolio. And the reason why we look at the median is because we do have names as high as thirty five times, which is Alphen, in fact, the one you'll see on the top. Uh, left-hand side of the screen, uh, all the way down to names on seven, seven and a half times PE, which is EDUX, which you'll see on the top right-hand side of the screen, YDUQS. Um, so this, we, we're not screening stocks on traditional valuation metrics, as you as you probably gather from that that vast range. And it's perhaps worth talking about the valuation potential in, in all of the, and both of those two extremes. Uh, but it, currently, the, the 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 PE, the median PE on the on the core portfolio is uh, just shy of twenty one times. So on a one year PE basis. So obviously not the same as a bank stock or a uh, or, a, or a, perhaps an oil and gas company, because that's not where we're looking. For, uh, what we're looking for, um, but clearly for the long duration of growth that you get from companies like these, you know that for me is bargain bucket. This is what we're looking at now. In my opinion, is an opportunity, and I'm not trying to time the exact day, obviously, but in some of these names in particular, you know, the, the opportunity is has not been. Uh, as attractive as it as it is right now uh, for for many many years perhaps going as far back as 2014 or even late 2013 so i think you know for these sort of stocks if you aren't buying at that very speculative raunchy end of the market which as you've as we've alluded to we we just ignore that part of the market completely um you know the the this indiscriminate selling of growthier companies growthier assets has really opened up the door for for the patient now yeah, it's perhaps uh, it's perhaps worth saying. Sorry to jump in there, James. You know, I mentioned you know Alfin is at the top end of that curve, so that's the company you see on the top row of these these names. You know, that's a business which on yes, it's on a thirty five x one year PE multiple, but um, it's the leading 
these guys uh, are one of the, the three prongs of their businesses is um, is selling electric vehicle charging points. You know, they just re uh, reported results in their most recent uh, numbers, which had uh, their sales in that division growing threefold, threefold year on year, um, which came in, you know, more than 50 percent ahead of what that cons of consensus expectations of the sell side, the broker expectations uh, of the few handful of brokers that actually cover that that company. So, you know, the, the to, to to get things full circle to where you started this this uh, webinar off, uh, that is really the inefficiency that we are looking to exploit through this process. The impact side of things is what gives us the opportunity. It's what gives you the structural tailwinds that ultimately will drive. The opportunity that companies such as these are able to latch on to and benefit from but really the the inefficiency that we are playing we're not just buying these you know these speculative story stocks what our skill set and what our expertise is is going out and finding companies whereby the e in that pe ratio the 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 the, the denominator in that in that ratio is just too low, as with this example uh, of this stock that I've just uh, detailed, and that's that's really why hopefully uh, you know this this strategy will continue to be successful uh, into the future. Fab. I mean, that's one thing we look for as well because there seems to be a very much a behavioural characteristic with analysts. And hey, you know, I've been on that side and I've done this myself, but analysts tend to systematically and systemically but but continually <laughs> underestimate it's all very well overestimating earnings going into a recession let's say but over the long term it is astonishing yes how analysts have materially underestimated the growth prospects of, of well of amazon of google if you look back at some of the earnings estimates from like five or six eight or ten years ago they are a multiple away from where they are today and yeah and i very much buy into the case that you're going to see this with a couple of these stocks here that uh, the broader analyst community haven't got close to because it's not very um it's, it's not great for your job when you're going to estimate top line growth to, to multiply by 20 times over a five-year period exactly. but it occasionally does happen exactly uh, so, I'm sure there, you know, there'll be a couple of those buried in there somewhere in the portfolio. Oh, I hope it's more than more than a couple, James. I mean, we, you know, that's that's exactly what we're trying to concentrate this portfolio on. And and uh, you know, that what you're alluding to is this this clustering slash anchoring bias, where um, you know, where ultimately you get clustering around historic growth rates within a range of where companies have grown historically. So what I have done, and, and this, you know, again, I'm going back to, to the sort of story of, of me, if you like, where I sort of made my name as a stock picker and an and analyst prior to becoming a PM was, was really in finding those companies when they were at that stage on a hockey stick curve, where all of a sudden their revenue started to accelerate. And because these are businesses which have, you know, Anyone who's done economics, economics 101, uh, will know of the uh, the concept of economies of scale. And as you grow larger, for for various reasons, as your revenues grow because of that scale effect, your earnings, you know, the the, the output of that that uh, PNL, if you like, grow at an even faster rate. And therefore, the ability for you to beat expectations is even larger when those revenues and earnings are accelerating. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. It's, it's to exploit that anchoring bias, which is always going to be more prevalent when companies are at a smaller stage. And that's, that's why I like mid caps. Mid caps, you're still, you're, you're beyond that really speculative stage whereby, you know, very small companies who are yet to prove themselves. So you have some proof of concept, but at the same time, you still have potential to offer almost venture, at least unlevered venture capital-like returns uh, with, of course, daily liquidity and all of the things that, that you no doubt want as, a, as an equity investor. Wow. So just to remind us, how big is the fund at the moment? Does it sound how big is the strategy? The strategy itself now, it's four funds uh, across various regions. The strategy itself now is... Uh, uh, in, in, in sterling terms, um, depending on where pound sterling is right now, uh, around 300 million uh, pounds. Um, but uh, hopefully it's, 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 you know, it's, it's got some good uh, reception and some good pipeline. So, uh, and, and definitely a lot of interest in this space generally. I think you know, I mentioned I've just come back from the US. There's a lot of interest for these sort of strategies out there. 
And I think it's this this combination of returns focus with the impact side of things, which is uh, which is proving to be you know, quite a, a an attractive proposition for uh, uh, for investors across the globe. Sure. So, the how long has the actual Regnan uh, the equity impact solutions fund been going now? It's just we, years. We started off in October 2020, um, and uh, yeah, so that's that's when it launched. And obviously, we used to run the, the Federated Hermes Impact Opportunities yeah. Fund before that, which is very much the same people and same process. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, the, I think the one thing that uh, hopefully we demonstrate here is that there is absolutely no point waiting for three or a five or a ten year track record uh, with a fund like this, because I fear that uh, you could have very much missed out of. Some of the, some of the returns. Certainly, as Alberti shop, we we don't see the point of waiting for it to deliver before we jump on that. That as part of the criteria is certainly um, d- doesn't really make a lot of sense to us. If the strategy makes sense, if the personnel makes sense, if everything else stacks up, then we're we're happy to buy in. So I think we did actually buy in a little bit at the uh, actually when when you launched. I was just trying to lost track of time a little bit there. But now it's within the model portfolio service. And of course, it fits within the core suite for us. uh, But by its very nature, of course, it fits very neatly with our ESG suite as well, uh, for obvious reasons as well. And so, um, yeah, we've got a a fairly solid, chunky holding running through the portfolios. And uh, and I would expect us to uh, uh, this to stay within uh, for, you know, for a very long time and certainly for as long as. Tim is around at Regnan. So, I mean, I think on that, Tim, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. We got there in the end. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and I guess the point is that the, it was basically rather cringy, but I, I'm going to say it right now. Part of the reason we, we bought this fund and we bought into Tim is that we think Tim is going to be a big superstar in the future. And we wanted to get it on video now so that at some point in the not too distant future, we can look back and I can sort of say, I told you so. Um, so there you go. Well, that was, <laughs> that, a, bit, it was a bit cringy, wasn't very it? Very kind of you, nevertheless. I'm, I'm touching, I'm not superstitious at all, by the way, but I find myself touching uh, wood over here and uh, yeah, making sure that uh, we, can, we, can, we can live up to that promise. So I ho- and I hope we can. Fab. Okay. Well, I think actually, have we got any q and I can't see any. Um, hopefully we've answered everything. We've pretty much kept everyone on as well. I don't think we've lost hardly anybody along the way. So thank you so much, uh, Tim. Uh, we'll hopefully catch you soon. Watch this space. There'll be other masterclasses coming your way. But uh, on that, thanks a lot. Have a great afternoon. Cheers. Thank you all.